we need to keep bringing it up. It's obvious people don't want to talk about it. We have two of our major presidential candidates. They really don't want to talk about it. Welcome back to this week's episode of The Feds. I am Stephanie Weidel. I'd like to encourage you all to check out the Feds for Freedom Substack, where you can read almost daily articles informing you of some of the most pertinent topics to our freedom fight. If accountability and reform is what you seek, check it out, share it, and share these podcast episodes. And of course, visit the Feds for Freedom website and donate towards our mission at fedsforfreedom.org. Welcome to the Feds, insiders bringing accountability, integrity, and reform to a broken bureaucracy. At Feds for Freedom, we value constructive dissent and healthy debate. The views and opinions shared in today's episode are those of the speaker alone and do not express the views or opinions of the U.S. government or any other employer. We are honored to be joined today by cardiologist, internist, epidemiologist, one of the most published medical professionals in the world, and also one of the leading medical dissenters of our COVID era, Dr. Peter McCullough. Dr. McCullough, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It is such a pleasure. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Most of our audience knows your history. In your own words, what keeps you motivated in this fight for truth and transparency? I was so disturbed, uh, really, from the onset of the pandemic that what I was seeing with respect to every uh, public health policy, the response from the medical community, and then what happened with the COVID-19 vaccines as being so injurious to to family, friends, to my patients and the population at large, uh, I, I told myself I just couldn't stay on the sidelines. I understand. Well, so let's talk about your paper. You and other scientists known for discrediting false narratives like Stephanie Seneff, Steve Kirsch, Jessica Rose, to name several, have just published a two-part paper titled COVID-19 Modified MRNA Vaccines, Lessons Learned from Clinical Trials, Mass Vaccination, and the Biopharmaceutical Complex. There is a ton packed into this paper. What were the main lessons that the paper revealed? And what is your call to action? You know, this is a paper now in two parts. I think the number of references is well over 500. First author is uh, Nathaniel Mead, who's a former NIH uh, staff writer. And the original paper was fully published in the Springer Nature Curious Journal of Biomedical Sciences. And uh, a typical paper in that journal gets about 2,500 downloads and reads in a year. Our paper in that journal in a month got 330,000 plus. Oh, And wow. for no objective ethical reason, the journal retracted our paper. And it violated the Committee on Publication Ethics or COPE guidelines. We protested. They didn't care. Uh, they had already charged us uh, you know, very heavy publication fees, copywriting, contracting. We had done everything. According to the book, this was part of medical history. And Springer Nature withdrew it. The paper was meritorious. In fact, more data had come in. And we actually had a story to tell about the the censorship of in, in the academic literature for papers that addressed vaccine safety. So we published it in two parts in the International uh, Journal of Vaccine uh, Safety Research. And um, and just as you indicated, uh, we I think we really bolstered the papers with some very instructive figures which clearly synthesize the data and show the risks of COVID-19 vaccination far outweigh the benefits. Let's talk right now about that weaponization of retraction. We have seen solid peer-reviewed papers, simple studies with data analysis uh, being published, discussed, referenced, and then suddenly retracted. It's like a gaslighting game. I mean, what do you make of this? What's going on here? You know, that could happen in the mainstream media and social media, but it should never happen in the peer-reviewed medical literature because there is a fair peer-reviewed process and uh, you know an editorial process, and these papers become part of medical history. They go back 100-plus years. We can trace the medical history of various products, 
uh, in vitro diagnostics, uh, various methods that were developed in medicine. So papers should never be retracted unless they actually meet what's considered the, the uh, Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines. When there's, when there's fraud, when there's um, plagiarism, and there's some, some clear characteristics. Now, I was the editor of two major journals for over 20 years, and I've just started as the editor of a major medical journal. And so I've been in this business for a long time. Under my leadership as an editor, I've never retracted a paper. Because if the peer review process is done correctly and the editorial process is done correctly, the paper is published as part of medical history. Now, if somebody reads it and they vehemently disagree with uh, the data or the interpretation and, uh, and the generalization, they write a letter to the editor. And then there's a response to the letter chair. There's a fair, there's a fair process. So uh, to give you an example, myself and uh, Nicholas Holscher and a group of authors published a paper about COVID-19 vaccine fatal myocarditis. We published it in the Journal of the European Society of Cardiology. And this became the, one of the most widely read papers actually in that journal in cardiology. And of course, there were letters to the editor. And as two letters to the editor came in, uh, they were reviewed, passed on to us, and we wrote responses to them, strengthening our, our positions. And then people can read the point counterpoint in that, in that dialogue. That's how scientific uh, interchange should happen. You know, when I published my, the very first paper on how to treat COVID, and so I was the very first person in the world to publish a peer-reviewed paper on a multi-drug protocol to treat outpatient COVID-19 in high-risk patients to prevent hospitalization and death. And it was published in the American Journal of Medicine. And I would have gone to New England Journal of Medicine, but we, we saw you know, corruption starting to happen there in Lancet and elsewhere. So I published it in published American Journal of Medicine. Do you know I got six letters to the editor, which is, which is a bit unusual. You know, Two is a lot. But I got six, and they came through. And then I answered them one by one. Typically, the letter would say, Dr. McCullough, you can't treat COVID-19. And then my response would be something like this. Overcome your fear and join me in helping people get through this illness and avoid hospitalization and death. And, you what know, and a great response. Hear, yeah, I would never <laughs> hear from them again. Uh, you know, Stephanie Senoff, is, I'm glad you mentioned her. Stephanie, the paper am I, we got a... Um, a, a strong letter saying uh, uh, he was rebutting all these mechanistic points. So then Stephanie Rebecca said, we even now have more information and we are producing a table of all the additional studies that support our position. So now there's even a table in response. And then that, that person wrote the letter to the editor is like, oh boy, kind of wish that they, you know, they didn't fire the first shot because the response shot is so much stronger. Now I actually have one with uh, Dr. Atherios Gukliaklis on um, treating severely hypoxemic patients and the same thing. We're actually responding with a very extensive uh, response to strengthen our position. But that's how it goes in the scientific literature. We ought to be having that instead of papers retracted and, as you said, gaslighting because it's unidirectional. This is very important. Anything that offered hope of early treatment was crushed and suppressed. Anything. Yes. Okay, and then anything that questioned the safety or efficacy of the vaccines was crushed. This is very important. So it's, it's unidirectional. So let me give you an example. If you were to take a major journal like New England Journal of Medicine and you pick any um, medical intervention, let's say back surgery, There'll be papers that say, well, back surgery works and it's a safe and effective. And there'll be other papers saying, mm, I'm not so sure. And there's always some pros and cons. There always is. Let's say for lipid lowering drugs like statins, there's always pros and cons. But with the vaccines, 100% of the papers in the New England Journal of Medicine say safe and effective. Nothing to the contrary. So there's a complete imbalance when it comes to the vaccines. And everybody should be scratching their head. Why? Why is this happening? Absolutely. Did retraction ever happen before COVID? Yeah, no, it happened. There's a, there's a website you can go to called Retraction Watch. 
And believe it or not, the number of retractions are numerous out there at the low level journals. So I have a Substack out on this and it's not a small number, but there, it is a, a traceable number. A lot of times it may be disagreement by authors or discovery of plagiarism. And again, it's at lower level journals. But, but this idea of having a paper fully published and then retracted for reasons that are not, you know, are not usually usual in customary practice. So the first time I had this happen to me, it was a it was a Taylor and Francis was the publisher. The journal was the proceedings of the uh, Baylor University Medical Center. It was my home journal, and uh, you know I had a paper. My second it was a second treatment paper. It was fully contracted, published, copyright, and then I got a notice saying, well, there was too much overlap with the first paper in the American Journal of Medicine. Well, you know, we had already run all the um, the overlap checks. There's all kinds of ways to do this with a copy editor. And I was like, wait a minute, is Taylor and Francis trying to suppress information on early treatment? And I went ahead and published that in Reviews in Cardiovascular Medicine. But it, it happened, this happened in the fall of 2020, before the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But it was the first time I'd ever seen this in my life. And I was, I was astounded. And I went to the editor of the journal, uh, the, the now deceased Dr. William Roberts, and I talked to him about it. He goes, I've never seen this before. I said, boy, there's something's unusual about COVID where we're seeing things that never happened before. Then with Jessica Rose, I had a paper on COVID vaccine myocarditis that was happening in young people. And six days, this was published in Current Problems of Cardiology by invitation, six days before the pediatric meetings on COVID-19 vaccines, of which myocarditis was going to be a big safety topic, the journal retracts the paper. And there, the publisher is Elsevier, the journal's um, current problems of cardiology. And we get a notice, we're retracting the paper. And we said, why? And they said, administrative reasons. You're not giving a reason. So it was, I mean, they were just, they were, they were clear about it. Uh, and then, uh, and then we brings us up to the Mead paper in Curious Journal of Biomedical Sciences. So I've seen it three times. And in my publishing career, I'm one of the most published people in my field in the world in history. I'm one of the most published scientists and, and, and doctors who have actually, you know, treated COVID patients in the world right now. I have over 70 mm -hmm. uh, peer reviewed papers in COVID-19 that I can tell you as you know, an experienced author and editor, what's happening now is very disturbing. It's specifically about COVID, early treatment, and the vaccines. So how do you bring accountability to these medical journals? Because they're trying we to obliterate a... the history and obliterate actual discussion. So far, uh, the Congress in Washington has called journal editors to testify, only one out of three uh, showed up. Uh, there are now um, various types of legal actions being taken against the publishers for fraud and uh, you know, intentional deception. We need investigation into who at these journals or publishers are making these decisions and are they influenced by outside forces? Mm -hmm. A very important piece of investigation by Rebecca Barnett in Australia of a paper published by a Chinese scientist who is operating out of Scandinavia on COVID-19 vaccines in cancer. When his paper was retracted, uh, that was objected to, and an investigation was uh, undertaken. And it was revealed through uh, FOIA that the journal had received phone calls and messages from a person uh, who, by looking him up, appeared to be an engineer from Germany uh, with no medical, or, no medical or scientific background that we're aware of, that he was applying sufficient pressure to prompt the journal and the publisher to withdraw the journal. So I contacted Rebecca. I said, Rebecca, the next step is figure out who this guy is. Is he? How does he have such power to exert pressure on a journal to do this? And, and the communications went something like this. This paper is getting too much attention. It needs to be pulled. And, and, and it, it makes me think the same thing happened with the Mead paper. I mean, again, average paper, 2,500 looks, and we're at, th at, at uh, 
300,030. That, that, that tells you that it has to do with visibility. And in my book, Courage to Face COVID-19, John Leake and I describe a biopharmaceutical complex. We think a syndicate is formed. Mm -hmm. They are uh, watching everything uh, in the mainstream media, social media, and the peer-reviewed literature. And when things get too much attention, then they can be stricken down. If they provide mm -hmm. any hope of treatment, or if they provide any information on vaccine or loss of theoretical efficacy, they're crushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the UN summit, as you know, is happening right now as we speak this week. Um, most nations, including the U.S., have signed on to the Pact for the Future. I mean, this is going along with what you're talking about. What are your thoughts on the role that mRNA gene therapy might play in supporting a one world government agenda? I mean, because we're talking about this biopharmaceutical complex that is overseeing a lot but it also goes in with, with one world government. So what are your thoughts on, on mRNA gene therapy supporting that agenda? Messenger RNA seems to be very important to the biopharmaceutical complex. In a paper by Lalani uh, in British Medical Journal, the investment of governments and biotech companies in messenger RNA goes back to 1985 billions of public and private money has gone into this. This has been the biotechnological dream to be able to, on a computer screen, create messenger RNA and then create any protein that one wants to create. So it's a powerful technology, but it's um, almost like nuclear technology. Uh, the ability to control it is, is we've learned with the COVID-19 vaccines is very, very um, tenuous at best, and the dangers are extraordinary. The messenger RNA has been pseudo-uridinated. It's made, been made fully synthetic. Uh, we do not have evidence that the human body can break it down. Experts do think some RNA aces potentially can break it down over time. Two studies, one by Fertig and the other one by Castriota, show it's circulating in blood for 30 days, but that's as long as they've looked. could circulate longer. There uh, appears to be no way to shut it down. Once it's in the mm -hmm. body and the body starts reading the messenger RNA, there's no stop button on it. So it appears to be very important to the biopharmaceutical complex. Uh, virtually every vaccine is on a schedule to be converted to messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, linked to this UN agenda is what's called uh, WHO Agenda 2030. This is startling. You can go on their website or just, just search, search Google Images, Agenda 2030. Uh, it aspires to have 500 vaccines for each person in the world. Did, did, and did you say that every shot on the schedule, they're hoping to convert to mRNA? Uh, Moderna has 31. And remember, most vaccines at this point in time are not medically necessary, not clinically indicated. They're not very effective. Um, all the diseases that we vaccinate for largely went away with improved sanitation, water, improved living conditions. And so they're, in a sense, legacy diseases. We don't face threats of of uh, smallpox or polio or measles, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. There's simply not big threats um, out there. And, um, and even when vaccines are suspended, like pertussis vaccine was suspended in Sweden for you know, over five years, there was no recurrence of pertussis uh, because mm -hmm. you know, we, we treat it with a Z pack anyway. So you know, it's not like it's a big deal to, to have a, you know, a diphtheria pertussis infection. So uh, what we know is that all of these vaccines, which almost certainly were relatively safer, now are going to be put into this new mechanism, messenger RNA. And what could be a relatively safe vaccine could be turned into a dangerous vaccine. And the first one up is the influenza vaccine. So the influenza vaccine right now comes in a couple versions. Uh, most of it is either the live attenuated vaccine, which is the flu mist, or just the killed vaccine, which is uh, an injection you know, in the arm, the killed virus. But if we take the spike protein of influenza, which is the hemagglutinase, and then put the genetic code for this in, on messenger RNA and produce uncontrolled quantities of the, of the hemagglutinase, 
we could actually be in trouble. We could actually make a serious illness. And on top of that, in a paper by uh, Boros uh, and myself and others, we've shown that the messenger RNA doesn't cleanly make just one protein. It's misread by human ribosomes and makes what's called frame-shifted proteins, about 12, in the case of COVID vaccines, about 12 additional unwanted peptides or proteins. And then those can be expressed and cause cellular dysfunction or autoimmunity. So there's a great concern that every messenger RNA product will cause autoimmunity, the body's immune system to attack itself, will overproduce dangerous antigens like the hemagglutinase or the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein or you know, the tetanus toxoid, you can go on and on. And that, and that because they're genetic, as you pointed out, they're gene transfer technologies, there's great concerns that they could permanently install their genetic code into the human genome, that they could be related to cancer. Uh, and so th this is a, a unbridled technology that I think there should be a complete moratorium on the development yes. of messenger RNA until we understand the, f the fundamentals of its, its preclinical profile, its pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, its distribution, et cetera. It's it's astounding. You're calling for the stopping of all mRNA lipid nanoparticle platforms, and yet we're seeing in the news, like CBS News, calling uh, Surgeon General of Florida Latipo a misinformation spreader by trying to set to prioritize non mRNA shots over mRNA shots because he knows the danger of it. There's just a concerted effort to get that mRNA into people's bodies. Well, listen, we've been here before. If we were to go back to 1949, Rose and Hill presented to the Medical Research Council that smoking, and doctors and nurses were smoking and advertising cigarettes, that it causes lung cancer. They, they said, listen, it causes lung cancer. We're greatly concerned it causes lung cancer. And the doctors, the medical community, no, it doesn't cause lung cancer. The tobacco companies, no, it doesn't cause lung cancer. And so doctors and nurses smoke cigarettes in the clinic, the operating room, told patients they didn't cause lung cancer. This went all the way to the U.S. Surgeon General's report in the 1960s. And the conclusion was, uh-oh, they cause lung cancer. So I'm <laughs> telling you right now, it's 2024. And I am saying we should suspend all messenger RNA biotechnology development. 2022, I called for the vaccines, COVID vaccines to be pulled off the market in the U.S. Senate. Mark my words, we're going to get to, let's say, 2030 or, yeah, uh, 2022, let's add on, yeah, 2040, 2042. We're going to get there. And people are going to look back and say, oh, my gosh, Dr. McCullough was right. It's just like Rosen Hill were right, that we shouldn't have pushed forward this, this messenger RNA technology. So let's talk a little bit about vaccine injury. Um, first, for those who do not seem to be vaccine injured at this point from the COVID shots, do you think they are out of the woods? Or do you anticipate that they will see vaccine injury um, later in their life or in, in the next couple of years? We simply don't know. Uh, I testified in U.S. Congress earlier this year that we have about a five to 15 year worry of concern. As a doctor uh, and as a you know, leading doctor in my field, I am worried, you know, at least for five to 15 years after the last shot. There could be a new problem develop, a, a blood clot, a development of heart failure, cardiac arrest. And we are seeing these cases where people took the shots in 2021 and they're having a cardiac arrest in 2024 or a new blood clot. Now, two papers, one by Schmeling, one by Manichi, show that the 2021 shots were far riskier than the later shots. And in part, remember 2021, the shots were all coded for the original Wuhan spike protein. And then in 2022, we had the first Omicron shots that, that came in. And so Omicron was a file, far, far milder spike protein. So uh, virtually every patient I see who's been damaged by the vaccines took, took, the, took the initial shots in 2021. So it may be that those who took their first shots in 2022 or 2023, it may be that indeed they are out of the woods. Hmm. 
Uh, do you see a difference in the kind of vaccine injury you're seeing now versus at the very beginning? Like, as, as time has gone on, has it? Have you seen differences? Uh, the the first point to be made is both the Janssen vaccine and AstraZeneca vaccine had explosive blood clots develop within a few days or a few weeks. It's called vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpurea. A paper by Wu and colleagues from the US FDA described thousands of blood clots after Janssen, thousands, extending from the ankle to the hip, 11% were fatal. Uh, we don't see that anymore because Janssen has been pulled off the market, thankfully. AstraZeneca, likewise, after a court case in the UK, has been pulled off the market. So yeah, we don't see those horrible, you know, adenoviral vector blood clot cases because the product has gone from the market. With the, um, we see far less vaccine injuries now, largely because people aren't taking the shots. Recent CDC data show uh, that through beginning of this year, through April of 2024, only 1.6% of Americans took a COVID shot. Mm -hmm. And where does cancer fit in with that? We don't know if the vaccines cause cancer or not. There have been some uh, early cases where it looks like it's implicated. I've been an author on two of these cases. Um, multiple theoretical papers have suggested the vaccines could either cause or accelerate cancer via multiple mechanisms. Every cancer registry right now is on the way up. There's increasing cases of cancer. The only new exposure in 2021 is the vaccines. But the National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, None of them have considered the COVID-19 vaccines as a concern. Mm -hmm. So let me ask about shedding. What are your recent thoughts on shedding? And this kind of, uh, I'm going to ask a question how uh, specifically mRNA shedding, what that looks like. So what are your thoughts on shedding? Best person to quote on shedding is Helene Benoon, a former insert researcher in France, Shedding is real in terms of breastfeeding women transferring messenger RNA and spike to the baby. That's been proven. Two papers by Hannah. Uh, it, uh, messenger RNA is in blood for 30 days, spike protein for six months at least, but there's never been a confirmed case of transference by a blood transfusion. Just hasn't been reported. And um, while the messenger RNA and spike get into breast milk, that means it should get into sweat and oral secretions and urogenital secretions. There's never been a case of shedding confirmed by kissing or sexual intercourse. The one area where it looks solid, there's some type of shedding, it probably through the air, is in menstruating women. So if a vaccinated person comes in contact with a woman who's young and you know, uh, you know, having her periods, the periods will be altered. And this can be as much as 75% of those would have their periods altered. It implies something is affecting the body of the unvaccinated menstruating woman. That's probably mm -hmm. the best example. But fortunately, no serious cases that we can discern at this point in time. Is it specifically with the mRNA shots that we're seeing this? Is there something in the gene therapy that is being shed? Like, what is the mechanism that you think produces shedding. Yeah, almost there's no everything live we're virus, seeing, correct? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Almost everything we're seeing is with messenger RNA, partly because of the 75 to 80% of Americans who took the shot, 94% of that is Pfizer Moderna. The, the, the CDC and the FDA pushed messenger RNA preferentially over Janssen, which is adenoviral DNA, and Novavax, which is just the spike protein. In fact, Novavax is never mentioned by the government agencies, and it's been an option for people to take. And, and why and, is that? It's, it's, one can't explain it. If we look at safety, my analysis is the most dangerous vaccines were the very first Moderna vaccines at 100 micrograms, then Pfizer at 30 micrograms, then Janssen, uh, the adenoviral vector, and then the safest of all was Novavax. But the, the CDC and FDA just never present that as an option. Uh, even a lot of public health agencies never present it that way. Again, we just, again, you can't explain it, but there is this preference for messenger RNA technology. And um, uh, yeah, we are seeing most of this is uh, with the messenger RNA because most people take it. 
uh, in theory, if it's spike protein shedding, it should happen with all the vaccines. Mm. Let me ask you, so in your paper, you point out that there was no control group in the clinical trials of the COVID-19 jabs. Why is this so important for people to understand right now? It's important to understand that when we do a randomized placebo-controlled trial, the people who get placebo, we better know that they got placebo and who got the real shot, they get the real shot. But those people themselves, they can't know what they got. This is very important. So because the shots are so toxic and there's so much arm pain and fever, the patients who got the real COVID-19 vaccines in the original trials, they all knew they got the real thing. Those who got placebo or the saline, they all knew they got saline because they didn't have any reaction at all. So because of that, those who got the shots psychologically thought they were protected. So when they did get a cold, they were much less likely to go get a COVID test. And so there were fewer people coming forward for evaluations. And then if ones who got the saline shot, they said, oh boy, I'm not protected at all. I probably got the placebo. They were rushing forward to get evaluations if they got a, a cold. So right there, that source of bias you know, made it look like the vaccinated group was protected, what in fact they weren't. And then the second part of that is uh, people weren't considered vaccinated until they had two shots. In fact, they had to be several weeks after two shots. Well, after the initial shot, those who took the vaccine, there was an explosive number of cases of getting COVID. Mm -hmm. And despite the biases of people not coming forward, and all of those cases weren't counted. So what's mm -hmm. called intent to treat principles weren't followed. Yeah, so intent to treat principles not followed. This, uh, you know, effectively no blinding. And then once we get past the primary series in the first month, this kind of blanking period, and then the observation period for another couple months, then the trial is stopped. And then immediately those who got placebo were told, here, just go ahead and take a vaccine. So it wipes out any control group. So it wipes out any ability to look at what happens to somebody who doesn't take the vaccine. Now, fortunately, in the United States, the best estimates are 25%, maybe 20% did not take the vaccine. I never took the vaccine. It was never safe enough for me. I'm an expert doctor. I looked at this carefully. And of, the, of, the, of those who did not take the vaccine in the United States, we've done really well. So in the Cleveland Clinic study by Shretha and colleagues, those who did not take the vaccine at the Cleveland Clinic, way fewer recurrent COVID infections than people who took one, two, three, or four shots. In fact, the more shots, the more COVID people get because the shots backfire and they don't work. Mm -hmm. It is my understanding that no clinical trial for any vaccine on the FDA schedule has ever had a true placebo group. Is that a valid statement? That's correct. When I mean true placebo group, that's uh, where it's double blind, you know, double, uh, you know, dummy, where we actually cannot tell who got what. The vaccines have been incrementally developed where they're typically compared against the prior vaccine. So if there's a, you know, if there's a quadrivalent vaccine and it's, it's, uh, it'll be trialed against a, a 23 valent vaccine. So the vaccines just undergo this, this steady progress because of what they call a predicate standard. But there is an assumption at baseline that the vaccines are safe. And so therefore they don't undergo true double blind randomized placebo controlled trials. And they don't have enough observation for safety. So for instance, we give a vaccine uh, because it affects the immune system, and the vaccines are supposed to last for many, many years, we would need many years of observation to see if they're safe. Right? Mm -hmm. You think about it. People say, well, take a polio vaccine. Well, you know, what is the duration of protection from polio? The assumption is it's lifelong. Well, we would need at least decades of safety observation, and we don't have that. So these, the assumptions are flawed. And there's no safety to follow it. So on my Substack, I posted a paper about hepatitis B vaccines. So hepatitis B vaccines given on the first day of birth and then on a schedule. Well, if we look at babies who got the hepatitis B vaccine, they follow the schedule. When they become teenagers, 
they have no effective protection. None. And it's the teenage years when, you know, they could have exposure to IV drugs or tattoos, which they can get hepatitis B from, or from uh, sexual intercourse or what have you. So to give a baby on the first day of life something that's supposed to give them protection in the teenage years is, uh, is, is something, it's just, it's just really a bad medical strategy. The only kids that would need a hepatitis B vaccine would be mothers who actually have active hepatitis B or active IV drug abusing, and we don't know their status. And th those are pretty rare. So for the average baby born in the United States today, there is no, no medical necessity, no clinical indication, and no reasonable projection of efficacy that they take hepatitis B vaccine. So has your position shifted? I know when all of the COVID stuff came out, you were saying, well, this doesn't change my opinion on the regular FDA schedule vaccines. But has your position shifted now on the other vaccines now that you've seen how COVID-19 shots have been validated? You know, like most adult medicine doctors, I really didn't have a position on vaccines. I just accepted them like everybody else. If someone said, well, you have to take your annual flu shot to, you know, continue on medical staff, I just took an annual flu shot. I, so I didn't have a position on them. Uh, I was only involved uh, in terms of a clinical investigator on the development of one vaccine, and that was a staphylococcal vaccine for dialysis patients, and it never moved forward. So it just wasn't part of my scholarship to investigate vaccines. So what happened with COVID is it did become part of my scholarship to investigate the vaccines. And I have not liked what I've found. We've already covered some of this. Insufficient randomized trials for safety and efficacy, just strategies that look like they just have no chance of helping individuals. And then kind of a practice pattern of over vaccination. And so and this has gone back a long time. So let me give you an example. So I asked my mom for my vaccine card. I was curious. I said, boy, we're starting to look at this and it doesn't look good. Well, how many did I take? Well, I counted up the number of vaccines that have been injected in my body over the years. And the answer is 69. 69. 40 of them were flu shots. 40 of them flu shot in the medical field. And I was told I have to take a flu shot. Now, I've never clinically had flu. I didn't have flu before and after the shots. I've never tested for flu. I'm not at risk for influenza. I anticipate it's a mild illness anyway. There's four FDA approved drugs to treat influenza. It's just not a big deal. Influenza in a healthy young man is not a big deal, let alone a healthy child. But uh, 69 vaccines. And then I looked carefully at them, and I started to ask the question, uh, let's, take, um, let's take the mumps vaccine. It's part of the MMR vaccine. Well, it turns out I had mumps as a kid, and I confirmed it with my mom. I had mumps. I said, Mom, why did I get taken in for three more mumps vaccines after I had mumps? She said, well, it was just part of the MMR, and the doctor said you, you needed it. And then, you know, when I went to medical school, I had to get titers checked for MMR. And they said, well, you don't have adequate titers. You need to take another MMR shot. So I've taken multiple extra mumps vaccines for absolutely no clinical benefit because I've already had mumps. Do, do, do you see what I mean? So there's been, this, yes. has gone on, this, this has gone on from the 60s and 70s of over-vaccination. Let me give you another example. You know, look at the R in measles, mumps. Rubella is German measles. Little boys do not get serious German measles. You can't tell it from a simple runny nose. You cannot. The only serious German measles that happens is in pregnant women who can have congenital rubella syndrome. So mm -hmm. why was I given a rubella vaccine? It's just, it, it, it was just a complete, it's just like the mumps vaccine. It was every boy who's been given a rubella vaccine it was a complete waste. Now, uh, when I was a kid, they didn't have the hepatitis B vaccine. But when I became close to being a healthcare provider, and I was drawing blood as a phlebotomist, then later on worked as an intern and cardiologist, I took the hepatitis B vaccine because for whatever theoretical protection it could protect me against hepatitis B, I wanted that protection. 
you know, when I went to uh, India for the rainforest, I knew I was going to be exposed to other illnesses. I took a battery of vaccines for travelers that go to these endemic areas. That's fine. That's, that, that's a personal choice. But this idea now that, you know, babies are giving COVID vaccine vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines and influenza vaccines, pregnancy. So when my wife was pregnant, there were no vaccines given to pregnant women. The outcomes were fine. Now, like starting about 10 or 12 years ago, pregnant women started to actually be told to take vaccines for influenza and for diphtheria, tetanus, acellular pertussis, for, um, for, for now COVID-19. And sadly, the majority of those who took COVID-19 vaccines took it in the third trimester of pregnancy, where the chances of transference to the baby are much higher. Uh, so something has happened. Something has happened with the, the medical orthodoxy and the group think around vaccination. And you know, it's culminated in Agenda 2030, which is an aspiration of 500 vaccines per person, 500. I've already taken 69 shots. I mean, really, am I going to take another you know, 431 shots? It's astounding that they think that normal people would go along with that. But as you said, it's a group think now. We see this mass formation psychosis. You know, it, people are, are not thinking. Well, let me give you a vignette. So I was with Nick Hulsher at McCullough Foundation, and we presented a, a poster at the American Society of Microbiology in Atlanta, Georgia. Huge meeting, tens of thousands of infectious disease doctors, vaccinologists, all the industry people. And this older doctor came up to our poster. And uh, he was looking at it, and he, he, he kind of rubbed his arm. He says, you know, I took five shots in this arm, and I can't use it anymore. I've uh, I've got a neuropathy, and we're talking about the COVID vaccines. I can't use it anymore. He says, but if they come out with a sixth shot, I'll take it in the other arm. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about did you, this. Did you uh, ask him about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just, he's convinced that, that's, that these are good. Look at uh, 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 President Biden. He's taken six shots. And he's had three documented episodes of COVID-19. The last one was around the time where essentially he was told to step down from uh, campaigning for president. Look at former NIA director, Anthony Fauci. He's on record for taking six shots. And, you know, he gets a, an episode of COVID. You think at some point in time, they would just kind of not get a COVID test or not go public with this. Because in, you think it's a public embarrassment to show the vaccines are ineffective. But, but but rather, no, they go public with getting more shots and getting more COVID. Mm -hmm. It's just astounding. I want to go back. You, you mentioned before the flu shot, and they're mm -hmm. close. Do, are they close to ha putting mRNA in flu shots? It's, it's upon us. Yeah, it's, and you it's, mentioned it's, that it, they're... Yeah, it's imminent messenger RNA flu shots and messenger RNA respiratory and social virus shots. I mean, those are imminent. We can check the approvals, but you can expect those out there. So if one is going to take any more shots, you better really ask which, which one it is. You mentioned that there are four drugs out there to treat flu. Mm -hmm. Would, if you use a drug at all, um, because it is mild, as you say, um, but would those same drugs even work against an mRNA Kind of, if, if you had mRNA in your body producing this, would those same drugs even work? Mm, that, that's a good question. I would probably say no, because the drugs most of them work on the replication enzymes and not directly on the dangerous antigens. So, no, we couldn't use them as an antidote, sadly. The only antidotes we've published with Nick Hulsher, McCullough Foundation, could be a small interfering RNA or something called a Robotech technology. So believe it or not, companies are working on an, uh, uh, antidotes for messenger RNA vaccines. That's how bad they are. Can you imagine <laughs> making something that now you have to make an antidote for? Uh, it's but, but just you, astounding. Think about two thirds <laughs> of the world took these shots and people are now scrambling. How do they get them out of their body? What they should do now? <laughs> Well, so uh, what are the companies that are making those antidotes? Do you know? 
Well, one of the companies called Neo7 Bioscience, led by Dr. John Cantazaro. So first up is actually a peptide infusion to neutralize the spike protein. Wellness company is offering a trio. It's called Ultimate uh, Spike Detox. So they're going to have a um, extra strength spike detox that combines natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. You can buy those over the counter as supplements, but they're combined with other products to kind of enhance absorption and make them more effective. Uh, I think the oral spike detoxification programs, those are the most available, evidence-based, practical, safe ways to go. Um, there's a lot of other assistive things, but they don't get rid of the spike protein like N-acetylcysteine, vitamin C, nicotine. We can use those to help with symptoms, but we need to get rid of the spike protein, which is massively accumulating in the bodies of the vaccinated. Absolutely. Dr. McCullough, our organization consists of some of the few government insiders that have the guts to demand accountability and truth. Uh, what should they look for or and do as we are entering a one world government push that is highlighting health as its reason for control? It's almost like we're back in the late uh, 18th century when the French monarchs suspended government because of a public health emergency. So public health emergencies seem to be the most amenable to, for use uh, in those who want to grab power. And when Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, we do believe the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, UN, they're at the top of this biopharmaceutical complex. When he wrote the fourth industrial revolution, he said, listen, you know, the next revolution uh, the environment's not going to change. Mankind's going to change. You know, that was kind of a, a creepy, um, you know, foreshadowing of what could happen with all this genetic technology. Then when he wrote COVID-19 and the Great Reset and said COVID-19 pandemic will be a limited window to establish a new world order. Believe me, I think he meant it. Uh, you know, he meets very carefully with Anthony Fauci, and, uh, Francis Collins. Uh, Trudeau of Canada, Avril Haines, our current national director of intelligence. Now, anybody who goes to Davos, Switzerland at the meeting, keep a watch on them carefully. This biopharmaceutical mm -hmm. complex, which is a syndicate between uh, not-for-profit agencies, that'd be World Economic Forum, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Welcome Trust, uh, Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, um, uh, all of these are working very carefully with the government agencies, and they would include the regulatory agencies, the United States, CDC, NIH, FDA. They're working with the Department of State. It's very important. Department of State, de our Department of National Intelligence, for sure, because Avril Haines is formerly at the World Economic Forum, working with governments all over the world. The World Economic Forum had this Young Global Leaders Program, which in a sense was an indoctrination program to get world leaders in position for potentially a new world order. And it looks like it's happening. Yeah. Well, um, before I ask my last question, Dr. McCullough, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I just want to make people uh, aware that we've two years now into McCullough protocol based spike protein detoxification, the combined use of natokinase, 2,000 units twice a day, bromelain 500 milligrams a day, and curcumin 500 milligrams a day. You know, single uh, capsule combinations, just getting three and then taking them together. Two years into this, and we are seeing improvement. It's anecdotal. We see it case by case. No large prospective randomized trials, none even planned. So it's going to be down to empiric evidence. But I'm convinced uh, six to 12 months or more, Patients fundamentally get better. The antibodies against the spike protein decline. The neurologic, cardiovascular, and other symptoms uh, resolve. Blood clots resolve finally on blood thinners plus this. We commonly double or triple doses of natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. We do use it in addition to blood thinners. Main caveat is excess bleeding. But let me tell you what. I think this is the best hope of survival for humanity. Because uh, to allow the spike protein to continue to accumulate, don't forget the messenger RNA appears not to shut off, to allow the spike protein to accumulate after the shots appears to be very ill-advised and will lead to injury, disability, and death in some individuals. That's excellent. 
Thank you, Dr. McCullough. If the average American citizen could do one thing to combat the corruption that we see in our government and in our health system, what would it be? Yeah, I think that they would have to stop using pen names or pseudonyms. I think everybody on social media should be on there with their real name and not some and not some, you know, fake name that they're hiding behind. Uh, everyone would need to express themselves and be able to actually have the courage to stand up for who they are on social media uh, and uh, in person. And then let's just take an imminent threat like the vaccines. Every person every day should be talking about the vaccines and safety. And bring it up every day, just in every conversation. I'm concerned about the vaccines, concerned about this and that. Hope you're not taking more vaccines. You know, we need to, you know, talk to your your lawmakers about the vaccines. We need to keep bringing it up. It's obvious people don't want to talk about it. We have two of our major presidential candidates. They, they really don't want to talk about it. Nobody, the doctors and doctor's offices, the medical societies, senators, congressmen, they don't want to talk about it. So if they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to talk about it for a reason, because we should be talking about it. So everybody should be accountable. Let's talk about it. We'll get through it together. Yes. Thank you, Dr. McCullough. That's excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please like, comment, subscribe to, and share our podcasts. Visit our website where you can sign up for our latest newsletters and become a member of Feds for Freedom at fedsforfreedom.org.